Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for all of the time that you've given us to study together during these most uncertain times. I just ask that you would filter out all of the error, but seal to our hearts only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the book of Revelation verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were somewhere around verse 9. I, John, who, are your, who am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John is addressing himself to the seven churches. The word patience there in the Greek text means enduring in situations over which you do have control. The word is also used elsewhere where or another word is used for patience where there are uh, you endure in situations where you don't have control. And because of the testimony of Christ, he's on the Isle of Patmos. The, uh, the word is, is dia. He wasn't there in order to preach the word. Uh, what the text is saying is that he was there suffering, tribulation, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's been banished to the Isle of Patmos because of his testimony, because of his testimony of faith for Christ. And when that took place, of course, you know, when that took place is, is, a, is, is a problem of some debate. I believe it was in the reign of Domitian, probably uh, in the year AD 74 or AD 75. The problem with the date, of course, is whether or not, in your opinion, the things of, in the book of Revelation are things which are history, the preterist view, or things which are future, uh, which would be the prophecy view. I believe the testimony of history uh, and the evidence of research shows that it was under the reign of Domitian which would have been in the 90s. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and, heard, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And of course, as everyone knows, this is a verse of which there is much debate. Now, I've expressed previously in the past several videos, my position is that this is the day of the Lord spoken of in the Old Testament, which follows our departure. It's a very specific phrase used in reference to a, a very specific time. He was in the spirit, and there are those who think that he was in a, uh, a trance. There are others who believe that he was simply with the Holy Spirit in worship on Sunday, and then there are others uh, who believe that he was worshiping uh, in the Holy Spirit as a Jew on the Jewish Sabbath. And then there are others who believe that the Lord's Day is the day of the Lord that's spoken so often about, especially by the prophets in the Old Testament. And that's the view that I hold. I believe John was carried by the Holy Spirit forward to the day of the Lord the day of the Lord, of, of which you see so much in the Old Testament, which to me is actually in harmony with the idea that, that our journey out of time, remember John was a member of the body of Christ, is an entrance into eternity. The Lord's day is here in the text is a dative of location in the Greek. That's uh, that's where he was. He was in or on the Lord's day. 
I believe it's in the Lord's day. I believe it's a dative of location, first of all, because there's a preposition there. And usually the, the locative dative is used with a, prep, uh, a preposition in the King James. I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day, or on the Lord's day, if, if that's the way you want to take it, or at the Lord's day. Any one of those prepositions would be uh, acceptable in the translation. I believe that the Holy Spirit is telling us that He transported John to a time, quote-unquote, I put that word in, in quotes, that is yet future. And he heard behind him a great voice as of a trumpet. And of course, this is also a word that sparks a lot of debate. God's voice is often referred to as a trumpet at Mount Sinai and many other times in the Old Testament. And we know what that voice said because we see it in verse 8, or we saw it in verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the first and the last. And so what he's clearly saying is, I am the great I am. Our God never had a beginning, and he has no ending. Our God is eternal. And I see John transported out of time into that realm of, of eternity. And from now on, what he sees, he's to write in a book, and he's to send it to the seven churches. And the Lord wants us to recognize that each of these are individual churches as well as a collective whole. You know, there could have just been commas used. That's what we would do in the English. You know, which would mean that we're looking at them only as a, a, a collective whole. But with the many objunction, conjunctions, which I pointed out in the last video, all of the ands there that appear in the text. You know, we look at these seven churches as uh, both individual as well as collective. I want you to take note of the fact that we've already had letters to seven churches. Okay? Already had that in the New Testament. And we'll look more at that when we get to chapter 2. But I find this very interesting. You know, we've had Romans. We've had Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Um, note that Ephesians is in the middle. Uh, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. I know there's a first and a second, Thes you know, Corinthians and Thessalonians, but seven letters. So we've had seven letters to seven churches. The only correlation between them is Ephesus. And that's the center uh, letter or church in, in the first seven. And only Ephesus is seen in these seven other letters, these seven letters in Revelation. Other than that, these other churches are not included in, in uh, those uh, first seven letters. So that's something that's worth thinking about. I can't tell you I have exactly the answer for that, but maybe you do. I believe that I believe that, that, that that is by design. We'll try to look more at that in detail when we actually get to the church at Ephesus in chapter 2. But he's to send, John is to send a letter to seven churches, and, and those separate, uh, collectively, they're all in the letter. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. Okay? And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto, like unto the Son of Man. Okay? Clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the, the paps with a golden girdle. His head and, and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And now we have a library 
of commentary of commentaries and articles and books written on you know telling you what John saw and 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 I think that that's one of the great problems with this book what did he see what did John see well you just read it that's what he saw why can't we just take it at face value why do we have volumes written saying that, you know, look, we got to tell you what John really saw. I know what he saw. He saw seven golden candlesticks. Well, Steve, what do they represent? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment, but, but, but what did he see? That's what he saw in the middle of those or in the midst, the, the word midst there in the text, of those he saw one like unto the son of man he really wasn't a man he's like a man but he's more than a man that's what he saw and he saw seven golden candlesticks and you know you can spend hours telling me you know what what they represent I've got verse 20 that takes care of that they are explained in verse 20. You know, some stuff here, folks, is explained. The stuff that isn't explained is what it is. And, and I don't see why that I should have a, a thesis written on apocalyptic language, which is all based on uh, sources, various sources uh, outside the Scriptures. I don't see any difference Listen to me, folks. I don't see any difference in the language in the book of Revelation in the language anyplace else in God's Word. And Revelation scares so many Christians, and it shouldn't. God is making something known to us. And this is what John saw. And you can say that that's what God looks like. Okay? I didn't write it. God did. And it is what he looked like to John. No man has seen God at any time. We know that. So I don't believe we are seeing John here as, as a man. Okay? And we know that when anybody had an encounter with the living God, they fell down as dead. Dead or in a doornail. You know, sick for 40 days. Paul received visions you know, which he wasn't allowed to reveal. Moses was struck down. The, the people, that, the, the soldiers that arrested Christ were struck down. The, the people fell back on their faces. I can give you case after case after case. I don't think most of us realize just who God is. You know, you know we tend to just, you know, make him a pal, you know, a buddy, you know. Now, he calls us friends, yes, but, but he is the awesome, almighty, majestic God who spoke the worlds into existence. And he speaks to us through his word. John saw his hairs. And we get all kinds of reasoning on what the white hair means. You know, what does the white hair mean? Uh, wisdom, okay? You know, stuff. You know, white as wool. His eyes is, is a flame of fire, and we, you know, we've had artists who've tried to draw this over the years, you know, with fire shooting out of his eyeballs and you know, stuff like that. I won't even make an attempt, okay, to explain these things. If you came here for that, I'm sorry. That's what John saw. That's all the text says. When he, when he turned, this is what he saw. And he had in his right hand seven stars. He had in his right hand seven stars. Normally the right hand means the hand of power. Christ sitting on the right hand of the throne in heaven. The right hand is always the, right, the hand of authority and rule and power. The, that denotes his power and his strength. This is simply an expression that speaks of the power and the authority that he had in his right hand. He held seven stars. Now this is what John saw. He held seven stars, and out of his mouth 
win a sharp two-edged sword. That's what John saw. And you can say, yeah, well, you know, Steve, I think this speaks of the Word of God. And you may be right. You know, we have Hebrews. The Word of God is a sharp, a double-edged sword, two-edged sword. Trouble with that is, is that it's a different sword there. That is a meat-carving sword. Okay, this is a two-edged battle sword. To me, that's, that represents judgment. Perhaps the Word of God and judgment. Maybe you could combine the both. The Word of God and judgment. I don't know, but it's what John saw. That's what he saw. And his countenance is as the sun shining in his strength. You know, and, and people can write paragraphs on that. And, and folks, my answer to the, is in my study of this, that's what John saw. Okay? And when I saw him, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. So would you. So would I. I'm absolutely persuaded that we try to make God a buddy rather than the supreme, sovereign monarch of eternity. And folks, I know he's your friend. I, I am in no way suggesting to you that, that you face judge, that God is scary or something, that you face God's judgment or God's fury. We see that clearly in this verse. On the other hand, on the other hand, we can't make light of God. I fell at his feet as dead, and, and we have a marvelous conjunction. I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Going back to Acts, we know, we, we, we remember the disciples were gathered together. Their, their whole world was shattered. It was devastated. You know, he's, he's dead and he's buried and, and he's not coming back, you know, and they're gathered together and some are saying that he rose from the dead. And Thomas, well, you know, we, everybody knows about Thomas. Thomas says, you know, I ain't going to believe that. You know, yeah, but Peter and John, they said the tomb's empty. And, and I don't know how the debate went. Probably kind of like a, all of our debates go, you know, with one another, on, especially on Twitter and Facebook and, and all that. And suddenly, Christ was there. And what was His first words? First words. Fear not. Perfect love casts out fear. I'm not asking you to be afraid of Him, folks. But I am asking you to respect Him for who He is. I am absolutely thrilled that He said, Fear not. I'm thrilled that he said, fear not to me. There wasn't anybody before me. I'm the eternal one. There'll be nothing after me. You know, except those that are mine. You know, remember that you're a new creation in Christ. I'm the first and the last. I am the one that lives and became dead became dead, was, my text says, the King James, the Greek says he became dead. That's what the text says. Why did he become dead? So that John might live. So that I might live. So that you might live. And for that, he had to die. He became dead because he died in your place. He died in my place. And had He not died in our place, we would die for our sins. The great gospel that we preach, that I, that I myself have delivered unto you through, at, in this, at, on this channel, the gospel which we received is that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Not according to what to some philosophy human philosophy 
according to the scriptures. In order for God to maintain His righteousness, it was necessary that your sins, my sins, be paid for. And Jesus Christ did that. But now the righteousness of God separate from the law being witnessed by the law and the prophets, you know the verse, even the righteousness of God which is by the faithfulness, not your faith, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ had not died in your place and your sins were not forgiven, then God is not righteous. That's what that text is saying. That was the witness of the law and the prophets, the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ for His own people. His own. I became dead, He said. He was not convicted by a court. He wasn't forced to die. He gave His life willingly. No man took His life. We know that. Pilate's power was given to him by God. I became dead. It was my will. I did it. It isn't a passive voice. I, you know, the passive voice would say I was made dead or I was killed. It isn't something which was placed upon me without my consent. I did it. I died. I gave up my spirit. I died. And in this context, He died for John, He died for you, He died for me. Fear not. You know, if that became dead wasn't there, the fear not could not be there. Because they are inseparably connected. The reason why we have no fear before God is because Jesus Christ died for us and He died in our place. And so many don't have that peace. And no one, no one can lay any charge against God's elect. I'm alive forevermore. He's never going to die again. Okay? He doesn't die in the Lord's Supper. He doesn't give Himself over and over again. I hear people say, you know, the, you know well, the minute that you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then God forgives you of your sin. Well, how did He do that? Did He die again? Does Christ die every time somebody makes a decision for Christ? If that were true, it would contradict what God wrote in His Word. In that He died, He died unto sin once and only once, and in that He lives, He lives unto God. Whatever was, was accomplished in the death of Jesus Christ is accomplished. It's done. And you don't add to it by something that you do, and you don't subtract from it by something that you do. It is a finished transaction. It's done. I'm alive forevermore. I'm never going to die again. And I'm not going to go through that again. All that was necessary all that was necessary to be done was done. When, when Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, I believe all of eternity looked forward to that moment, that specific moment in time. A march of 34 AD, I believe. But it was a specific point in time. You were in Christ when He died. You were in Christ when He rose. You rose with Him. Okay? And so many have detracted from the glorious truths of Romans 6 by trying to make it water baptism. You are identified. The word baptizo means to be identified with. You are identified with Christ when He died, not when you accepted Him or believed or received or any other thing. You are identified with Christ in His death and His burial and His res resurrection from the dead because He chose you, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. And have the, the keys of hell and of death. 
To me, that speaks of divine election. Now, to you, it may not speak go that far, but it, to me, it does. We don't possess those keys, okay? Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter, past, present, future. It's easy, folks, for me, at least, to see in that that what John is seeing, he is seeing from a standpoint, a not, not a standpoint of time, as we know it, chronological time, but a standpoint of eternity where time no, no longer exists. Okay? The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels, messengers of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Not hard to figure that out. He's told us. And without any chapter division, we jump into the seven churches. So we know what these things are. We know what they are. The seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches. And the seven stars or the angels or the messengers of those seven churches. Problem is, well, problem is all the books written on, on angels here. You know, you can go to some super, you know, duper experts, you know, of which I'm not, much more expert than, than myself, who will tell you that the word angel was never used of a man. I disagree with that. The word means message or messenger. It can be human or celestial. And it, it is definitely, listen to me, it's definitely used of a man in several passages of Scripture. So we can't use that argument. Listen, folks, if these are angels, they must be holy angels. I'm sure you would agree with me on that. Because there were angels that fell. And if they're holy angels, listen, listen, if they're holy angels, they shouldn't ever make any mistakes or do anything wrong, which we see that they do in the letters. Okay? But, but these angels do. They are human messengers. Some have said that these are the bishops of the churches. Others have said, well, you know, these are the, the deacons, the pastors, the, you know, the, of the churches. I'm of the opinion you don't have to be. If you disagree with me, go right ahead. Just get in line. I believe that these angels of the seven churches is the message of that church. And I trust that the witness, the testimony of this online church, Blessed Hope Forever, the message of this ministry is, and I pray, this is my prayer every day, is that it proclaims the, the message, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Either that angel is a heavenly angel who can make mistakes, or that angel is that messenger uh, in the church. It's an individual or an individual in the church, some some elder, bishop, pastor, chairman of the board. I don't know. Take your pick. But it cannot be, in my opinion, a celestial angel. It's a singular representation of the message of that church. Now, you can go and you can visit the seven churches of Revelation. Just just hop on a plane, fly to fly to Izmir, Turkey, rent a car. You can visit all seven in a quick three day trip. But all you're going to see, folks, all you're going to see is a, a lot of rocks. They all lie in ruins today. And there are churches today who feel the constant pressure to compromise their faith by tolerating false teachers, not adhering to sound biblical doctrine, and leading lifestyles that mirror the pagan world around them. So why don't they lie in ruins as well? Why don't we see ruins on our street corner? Well, doctrinally, they do. They are subject to ruin. One would think that at least one, just one of the seven churches, you'd think just one, you know, here in Revelation would still exist today and be intact. But 
you know, uploading messages to YouTube, but none do. They all lie in ruins today to demonstrate the fact, I believe, that eventually that is the way all churches would go given enough time. Even, yes, and I'm going to say even this one. You know, if someone else were to take over the ministry. Paul said that they creep in unawares. They lie in ruins today. Oh, but Steve, they're lying in ruins because they're in Turkey. Well, you know, the people of Turkey are not the same ethnic people of the first century, and they're mostly Muslim, okay? You know, uh, Turks, they are... Uh, Turks are proud of their final overthrow of the Christian, uh, uh, you know, uh, Byzantine Empire in the 1400s. And, and folks, I have no issue with the warnings given in the churches. None at all. I know we're under grace. We're not under law. But he's writing to the angel, the messenger of the church, to the angel of the church at Ephesus right. And Ephesus being the most, given the most sincere warning, and Christ did remove its lampstand from its place because it did not repent. That repentance being a return to Christ from where they started, their first love. It's what happens to any church that leaves its first love. However, all, all seven now lie in ruins in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, and they do so, I believe, not because time has whittled away or withered away at their foundations, but because they departed from doctrinal truth. You know, there's a strong misunderstanding and misinterpretation misinter about the book of Revelation as it regards time frames, which is creating a serious misunderstanding, a serious error in understanding the book of Revelation and its prophecies. Most Christians, most Bible students, in fact, start with the assumption that the book starts at, at, a, at a beginning point on a timeline of events and it proceeds to, to, to describe events as they unfold and in a total linear fashion. It doesn't. Revelation is not chronological. And we'll see that as we go forward in this study of Revelation. Well, I'm out of time. Thank you all so much for all of your love, prayers, support, everything. I love you. Rest in Him. And until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.